any human voice, but we want to hear the heavenly voice. Open our mind, open our ears, open our heart to recognize your voice and realize the truth in our life. Speak to each one of us, us Lord. We thank and praise you once again. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You may be seated. There was a old king. So he's trying to, he's planning to connect, uh, he's planning to find a bridegroom for his daughter. Then he had a meeting with the leaders of the country and they all came to a conclusion saying that, okay, we need a bridegroom, a young man who should be a bold enough, who should be brave enough, who should be a strong enough, who should be an intellectual person so that he can be king after your, your, your retirement, right? That's what their aim. So in order to find out that kind of person, they all, with the king, the leadership came to a conclusion saying that we need to put a, a challenge, a game, a small game, which is very challengeable. Then uh, let's invite all the young people in the country so that those, one who win the game, one who like you know, solve the puzzle, he can be like you know, bridegroom to your daughter. That's what they decided. Then the next day itself, they just make an announcement in the country and said that the king is looking for a bridegroom for his daughter. So those who are interested, unmarried, main qualification is unmarried, then uh, strong enough, educated, and uh, those who are interested, so you are most welcome. So after that, when, I, they, when they heard, all the young people were excited in the country, and they want to do it, right? So everyone thought, okay, let me go and try my luck. Try my luck. luck. So if I win, I'll get a uh, good wife as well as position and the money and everything, power and everything, right? So if I lose, I'm not going to lose anything. So let me try. So, so many young people came to King Palace next day morning, like, you know, assuming they're going to conduct, uh, they're going to participate in that game. Then uh, when King came forward into his palace and saw a multitude of young people, those who were interested, then he was very happy. And he said, okay, I'm very happy to see you all the young men of my country. Thank you so much for coming over here. And you all please come, for, come forward, like, you know, come forward and come behind my palace. There is going to be a small game. So they all, like, you know, pushed, like they all uh, walked towards his palace backside. Then uh, they were just gathering and thinking, so what, go, what, what it is going to be? What kind of game you are going to, what is the challenge is going to be? Then immediately they saw a big pool filled with the water, like, you know, swimming pool. It's a bigger than the like a swimming pool. It's like 150 size, 100 in length and 50 feet width, filled with the water. Then uh, there was a like you know uh, three crocodiles are there in that water. So the king announced, "Okay, young man of my country, so this is the game. One who jumped into this pool and." Uh, swimming through by escaping these all crocodiles, three crocodiles, and we have not given them food for three days. They are looking for food. If you are able to escape those crocodiles and reach other side, then you are the winner. Then uh, he announced, then everyone is shocked. Oh, who is going to risk my life? Who is going to risk their life? So we don't want to risk. So everyone is watching, but no one is jumping. Everyone is watching, no one is jumping. Everyone is like, you know, seeing, no one is jumping. Finally, five minutes over, 10 minutes over, 20 minutes over, 25 minutes over, 30 minutes over, uh, suddenly a young man was in the water. So he was like, you know, trying to escape from the crocodiles and he's trying to like, you know, uh, like, you know, save his life, save his life and trying to swim, putting all his effort and swimming and escaping. And crocodiles are trying to hunt him and behind him, 
and he is escaping as everyone is like a surprisingly watching. So finally, he reached the other side. When he reached the other side, all the people just ran to him and started asking so many questions. Hey, what made you to jump? How did you do this? So what, what happened? So how did you jump? What did, why did you take risk? What happened? What happened? Why did you? Why? So many questions people started asking. Then when he came out, he said, stop, stop, please stop. Okay, before I answer all your questions, I'm going to ask you one question. Please answer me, then I can answer all your, all your questions. They said, okay, what is that? Actually, someone pushed me. Who pushed me into the pool? Who pushed me into the pool? So friends, church, if you go to any person with their full heart and touch their heart, any person, anyone in the world, if you touch their heart, their heartbeat, if you would be able to hear, every heartbeat is beating like this. Who did this for me? Who did this for me? Who pushed me into pool? Who pushed me? Who pushed me into this situation? Who pushed me into this sickness? Who pushed me into this sinful world? Who pushed me into this bad family condition? Who pushed me into this bad wife? Who pushed me into this bad, uh, cruel husband? Who pushed me into financial problem? Who pushed me into joblessness? Who pushed me into this pandemic? Who, 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 who? Right? So human beings these days, they were filled with the questions saying that, who pu pushed me into this condition? Who pushed me? Who pushed me? Right? So questions, questions. So I'm wondering if Jesus come back and he started walking as a human being on this planet, then people, so they have plenty of questions to ask him, right? They go and like, you know, dump all the questions on you. Why did you do this? Why did you do this? Why did you give me this husband? Why did you give this? Why did you do this? So many questions, so many questions. But church, remember, Whatever the questions you have in the world, whatever the situation you are going through, but only one answer is the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Name of Jesus is the only answer. So for every, every question, difficult question, the only one answer is the name of Jesus. Amen? Give him a big hand. Praise the Lord. So... The Jesus is answer for all the questions. Jesus is the solution for all the problems, right? So that's why today I was thinking, I was thinking the other day we were driving in a snow road in Colorado. I never seen, we never seen in our life that much snow. So full of snow. So I, as usual, I've been talking to my wife and driving without like an observing it's a snow road. Finally, we safely landed in a ditch on the road roadside. Safely landed by hitting a tree. So we safely landed. We gone off the road and landed. Then I thought someone pushed pushed us. So no one is there. Someone pushed us. So no one is there. So that's why today, when you look into the world. Everyone is suffering. Everyone is facing so many problems. The pandemic is going on. Uh, the uh, political, uh, political, uh, like, you know, something, uh, unstableness are everywhere in every country. So, so many problems. That's why when I started looking at the countries, different countries, different situations, I got an idea. I got a question. I got a question in my mind saying that, where is my God when I'm suffering? I started asking myself, where is my God when I was in the ditch? Where is my God when I gone off the road and landed in a ditch? Where is my God? Let me ask you, you are so silent. Where is your God when you are sick? Where is your God when you, when you are facing your problems? Kenton, you are able to show that? Where is your God when you are uh, suffering? Where is your God when you are in a ditch? Where is your God? 
So friends, so walk with me in this uh, spiritual journey and we are going to find out the answer at the end. So where is our God when I'm suffering? Where is our God when you are suffering? Right? Where is our God? So then, uh, so suffering, suffering everywhere suffering. Like, you know, everywhere suffering. So you cannot say, I'm not suffering, I don't have any problems, I'm safe. No one can say that because in uh, one way or other way, every man is going through suffering. Maybe different kind, different situations, different things. You, it may be different, but everyone is going through suffering. But everyone is asking, where is my God when I'm suffering? So Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 4, 19 and 22 says, my heart, Jeremiah is telling here, my heart, my heart, with a pain, my heart pounds within me, I cannot be still, for I have heard the blast of enemy trumps and, and the roar of their battle cries, wave of the destruction roll over the land until it lies a complete dissolution. Suddenly my tent are destroyed in a moment, my shelter are cursed. How long must I see the battle flags and hear the trumps of war? So this is Jeremiah is writing. So my heart, my heart, how long I'm going to hear the sound of war? How long I'm going to see the suffering? How long I'm going to see the dissolution of my tent? How long I'm going to suffer? How long I'm going to be here? The same way psalmist is writing like this. Psalm 88. 1 to 4 says, O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out to you by day. I come to you at night, verse 2. Now hear my prayer. Listen to my cry, verse 3. For my life is full of troubles. The psalmist is writing. My life is full of troubles and uh, death draws near. I am as good as dead, like a strong man with no strength left, with no strength left. So why it's happening? Every, as I told you in the beginning, every heartbeat is crying out, so I'm struggling, I'm struggling, one way or other way. It may be different to each person, but everyone is struggling, struggling. So when I started meditating this sermon, this sermon, I came across, so all over the world there are different struggles, but we can categorize into three kinds of sufferings in the world. Three kinds or three uh, types of uh, troubles or three types of strugglings, right? Number one, there are three kinds of suffering in the world. Number one, deserved suffering. Say with me, deserved suffering. Number two, innocent suffering. Innocent suffering. Number three, righteous suffering. So whatever the suffering people are going through in the world, doesn't matter. They all come to this category, either one category of these three. One is deserved suffering, innocent suffering, and righteous suffering. So you all know that. Then let's, let's, Explain each, let me explain each point in, in details. Number one, deserved suffering. What does it mean? Deserved suffering means, why should I deserve to suffer? Why should you deserve to suffer? Why? Because we sin and we suffer. We all know that policy. You sin, you did something and you are suffering. You did something and you are suffering. You all know, know what happened in the Genesis. You all know. So Genesis chapter 3, verse 16 says, God told to, like he, God was speaking to uh, Eve and Adam. So Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, he says, Then he said to women, God said to women, I will sharpen the pain. You, you have try to observe those words. I just enlarged and changed the color of the words. It came newly into the planet. There was, there was not there before. Right? There was not there those words before, but he just landed freshly. So what, what are those words? So sharpen the pain 
the pain entered. It was not there before. Then what happened? Then uh, of your pregnancy and pain will give you birth. And you will desire, your, like you desire to control your husband. Selfish desire started in the human beings. Right? Then he says, but he will rule, ruling over others, ruling one another. Like, you know, ruling one another. And verse 17 says, and to men, he said, since you, li you listen to your wife and uh, ate from the tree, whose fr fruit commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed. What came? The curse came unto the earth. Because of you, all your life, you will struggle to scratch a living from it. And it will grow thorns, thorns and crystals for you, though you will eat the grain. By the sweat, again, the other word, sweat. Before it was not sweating, no sweating. Now we had to sweat to live. Then he says, finally, you will return to dust. You will return to ground. That means death. So when they were disobedient to the Lord's command, these all new words came into the planet. I studied my special English. So we learned like an you know, origin of the language, how the words were formed, how the danger was formed, how the ox formed. So every word was formed with an incident one incident, in order to express about the incident, they created the word, right? Same way, these all new words came into the planet when they did sin, when they committed sin, when they, when they did against the God's law. Let me give you a practical example. You all know, like we all know, we did sin and we are suffering. So that's the, that's the uh, problem. We all know, let me give you one more uh, one more. Uh, Practical example. You all know cigarette smoking is injurious to health, right? So even it was written, it returns on the packet itself. And the government says, don't smoke, don't smoke, don't smoke. But what we do? We go and pay for it. What? What we do? We go and pay for it. And what we are, uh, what we are buying? A sickness. So after doing some years, what will, what will happen? Our lungs will be damaged. Then we'll come to church and started questioning God. God, I'm suffering with my lungs problem. Where are you? What are you doing? I'm suffering. See, where, what happened? Where are you? Even the alcohol. When you drink alcohol, even it written, it written on the bottle or whatever the packet, it says it injurious to your health. But what do we do? We pay for it and buy it for ourselves, right? We pay for it and buy it for ourselves. That's what, that's what, why we do this? Because we have the sinful nature we inherit from the, our forefathers. It comes from our forefathers. That's why uh, Paul says in his own words, Romans uh, chapter 7, 21, verse 21, it says, I have discovered this principle of life. Paul is writing, I have discovered the principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. Actually, I want to do right, but I'm without my control, I'm doing wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another powerful within me that is at war with my mind. What is that? A war within my mind. So we are facing war every day in our mind. So should I do this or not to do this? Should I go to church today? A lot of snow. If, if you compare with the Colorado snow, this is nothing. So Colorado snow, this is nothing. But because of like you know, this snow, some people got a reason to skip the church. That's OK. That's OK. But see, it's a war always in your mind. Should I go for it or not? Should I do it or not? So Paul was writing, so it's like a war in my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Verse 24. What a miserable person I am 
who will free me from this life that is uh, demonetized uh, demonet by sin and dominated by sin and death. And verse 25, and thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is in my mind. I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. I'm a slave to sin. Friends, we, we have the sinful nature. That's why we are suffering. And we make, because of that nature, we make decisions every day. So whatever the decisions we make, whatever the decisions we make, we have to go through the result even. Whatever the seed you sow, and you have to eat that fruit. Remember, so we try to blame God And we try to blame church or we try to blame pastor and saying that, oh, even though I'm regular to church, why this is happening? Why? Because long back you might have sown those seeds. That's why you had to eat those fruits. Right? So that's what. Why, what is this? Why we suffer? The number one is deserved suffering. That's why in the world people are deserved a suffering. Why? Because they deserve it. They want it. They buy it. They bought it. They pay for it, right? They got their own free will, so they are going and buying it. That's why. The second one is innocent suffering. What I said? The second one is innocent suffering. You see in the world, everywhere, innocents are suffered. Even when I when I'm read my Bible, when I read, like, you know, about the wars in the countries, wars are killing people. So many innocents were died in the war. So many innocents are died in the, in the corona pandemic. So many innocents. Uh, we don't know who created that virus or how it was created. We don't know. But so many innocent people, they died. They didn't do anything. They died. They didn't do sin. They didn't do wrong. But still, they're suffering. Why? Because of someone else's selfishness. Because someone else Like in a sinful nature, some people have to suffer, right? So that's why he says, we all know that no? Job says, Job crying to God like this. Chapter 9, Job chapter 19 verse 7 says, I cry out for help, but no one answer me. I protest, but there is no justice. God has blocked my way, so I cannot move. He has... Plagued my path into darkness. Same way even now. So he was crying. So what happened? So many times when people saw you, you were suffering, they think, oh, you might have done some uh, wrong or you might have done some sin. That's why it happened to you. I know one couple. Uh, I know one couple. Uh, so, they, so they got a children even when, you, when, you, when children born with a disability with some uh, health issues. So they are innocent people. Why they were born, born like that? Because someone is polluted the weather and someone ate the bad food or someone selfishness, so people are suffering. The innocent are suffering. So you all know in the Bible what happened. So Joseph was innocent, but because of his brother's selfishness, He thrown into you a, a ditch, a pit. He was just thrown into, he did nothing wrong to them, but he just shared his, uh, his vision or his dream. Then they were, they were uh, like, you know, jealous of him, and they just thrown into a, a pit. But still, but God was with him. Then what happened? Then he was in the ditch. Then what happened? The Daniel was innocent, but he was thrown into a lion's den. Right? He has to suffer. As an innocent, he suffered. Let me give you explanation, practical explanation one more time. In India, we, in India, like, you know, wherever, uh, small places, small places, so maybe one room, one room, one kitchen, one cooking area, one room. They all live together. So when the head of the family is smoking in the house, what happens? Everyone has to breathe that smoking, right? The smoke, everyone will breathe. 
So then what happened? They are innocent. They are not smoking. They are not buying it. But because of other person, they were affected. See, because of other person, they were affected. If, I, if all my family is in my car and I'm, I'm, I'm not concentrate on driving or I'm just you no know, lazy to concentrate, if I'm driving recklessly, what will happen? Because of my recklessness, my family will be affected. They are innocent. So who pushed me into the pool? Who pushed me into this situation? Who did this? Someone, someone selfishness, right? Someone selfishness. The third one says, the third one, the, the third point is righteousness suffering. Righteous suffering. So we stand for Jesus and gospel, then we suffer for it. When you stand for gospel, when you stand for Jesus, you have to suffer. We see all over the all over the world, like so many missionaries were killed, so many Christians were killed, so many pastors were killed. Why? Because they are just standing for the righteousness, righteous, righteous. They are standing for the righteousness. They are standing for the gospel. They are standing for God. That's why they were hate, right? Uh, that's why it says, like you no, know, First John three twelve. He says, we must not be like Cain. Who, be, who belong to the evil one and, and kill his brother. So what Abel did and why did he kill him? Because Cain, Cain had been doing what was evil and his brother had been doing what was righteous. So he was doing righteous and the Cain was not able to tolerate his brother's success or righteousness and he killed him. That the verse 13 says, so don't be surprised, dear brothers and sisters, if, if the world hates you. If the world hates you. Why world hates Christians? Why world hates uh, church-going people? Why? Because they cannot see you be a righteousness, righteous. They, wa they don't want to see you be like, you know, separating your life in God's way. They don't want to see you to be happy. They want, like, they don't, they are not able to, like, you know, uh, tolerate that as a kind. Then Matthew chapter 5, 10 says, God bless those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is there. Amen. So kingdom of heaven is there. And not only that, uh, Paul writes again to Timothy. This is a very important verse. Please follow that. Well, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says, Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Verse 13, but evil people, evil people and the imposters will flourish. They will, de they will deceive others and will themselves be deceived. So those who want to be live for God, they have to suffer. Even Jesus said with his word, so you, if you are following me, you will have troubles in the world. You will face troubles. You will face problems in the world. So when you are following me, you will, you, will, you will have to suffer for me. So you take up your cross and follow me. As I suffered, you will suffer. But remember, he is with you. Amen? So I just want to find out three things. Why did, uh, three reasons why did God allow sufferings into people's life? Why did God allow sufferings into our life? Number one, because God won't rob your free will. Why? God gave you free will when he created, right? You can choose which way you want to go. You can choose. So he don't want to come and control you as a robber. He, he does not have any remote in his hand to control you. Oh, don't go that way, don't go this way, come this way and stay here. Stay. He is not controlling you. But one who is controlling you? Your conscience, your mind, your heart. That's why Paul was writing, I want to do good but not able to do good because I have the sinful nature in me. Sinful nature in me. So why we are suffering, why God is like allowing some sufferings? Because you don't want to rob or free will. The second one is because he live, we live in a broken world. Everyone is selfish. 
we saw that uh, chapter 3 uh, genesis so those all things came into the world that's why we started suffering then the third why god allows suffering uh, sufferings third because suffering can draw people near to god sometimes when you suffer that's why he says when you have everything we say who is god we don't want who, what is chain so when you have some troubles something then you will remember is there anyone to help me is there a god to help me so that's why so many testimonies which we heard before like when they are suffering they used to call upon oh creator god please help me if is there any god please help me then jesus appeared that's why we have been reading uh, in the internet news so many uh, muslims in gulf countries they are praying that way oh creator god appear to us and show to us so that we may be saved that jesus has been appearing to so many people and they were converting into christianity when they prayed to god you all know we got we got a like you know in a previous so many like 150 years back we got a sadhu sundar singh in our country sadhu sundar singh he was a sick sick person but he burnt thrice a bible when the gideon people distributed a small new testament in the college he burnt them in front of everyone and he hated the christianity they finally finally one day he when he burned bible three times then he got a lot of disturbance in his mind he was not able to sleep not able to do anything no peace in his mind then one day he fasted and started praying to all his god dolls whatever he had and he started calling them oh you god come and help me give me peace give me peace then he started calling other other god name come and give me peace no one is answering no one is answering he was like you know from the morning from the morning he was fasted and praying to all the goddess whatever he know he started then he thought nearby his house beside his house there is a uh, there was a, a railway track a train goes there every one hour train passes through his house every one hour then he thought in my mind from the morning 6 o'clock i have been calling all the god names whatever i know but no one is hearing me so i will wait till 12 o'clock midnight if no one is going to answer me i'm going to stand i'm going to lay down on the track railway track and i want to kill myself that's what he decided then he started calling repeatedly again oh you god come and help me and next god you come and help me you god you come and help me finally he called oh is there any creator god one who created everything if he is there creator god come and show me yourself otherwise i am going to die now i am going to kill myself then finally jesus appeared to him and said i am the creator god my name is jesus hallelujah hallelujah praise the lord then he he just committed his life he started preaching preaching we we read so many books about him when he like you know whenever uh, he he was sometime in india sometimes in london sometimes in europe sometimes in america same he is the person like you know he been there three places in same time that's what we heard so we, they wrote so many books about him his name is sadhu sundar singh he's a great man of god great missionary so he is a god and he was he, he committed his life so that's why people why god allow sometimes suffering into our life because he want you to realize he is there for you amen so finally i am going to conclude so where is your god when you are suffering so where is your god you all know the bible so what happened where is your god where is your god you all know when joseph was in the pit and when he was in the in the jail where is god god was with him that's why we read he is so favor upon joseph and brought the people different people into his life so that they may like you know they helped him to grow up right 
So I tell you my personally, if we are here in this position, not because of our ability or capacity, not because of our background, only because of God and his mercy and favor. So he used to bring a different people into our life to help us, right? So we were, I just want to tell you my testimony before I close. When we, uh, when, I, uh, when I finished my college graduation, I committed my life for a full-time ministry. Then I, I went and joined in a youth ministry called Campus Crusade for Christ. I went to different states. So there I was in the seminary for four years. I studied and they made me a, a different state. Like, you know, you all know like uh, states are not like America. If different state means uh, that state should be different language, different food style, different clothing, different culture, everything is different. It's like, you know, we have, uh, like, you know, we have states. Each one is like each country with a different language. So when I went there, I had to learn their language, I had to learn their food, their culture, I had to learn everything, whatever they have. So I was placed there. Then uh, I was uh, one of the biggest, uh, big city called Chennai. I was the director for the Chennai Youth Ministry. Then uh, under me, like 18 people are working, all the missionaries, they're from different backgrounds, different language, different state, different backgrounds. There I met my wife. He was, she was also a missionary. So then what happened when we know each other, then we thought, okay, we could marry. So then we informed to our parents. So you know, my wife's parents are Christians. So for them, okay. You, if you marry a Christian person, that's okay. But my parents were non-Christians. And my father is very strict. So you don't want any Christians. or He doesn't want me to be a pastor. Because pastor has to go and beg for his food. So, no, so in our village, so they have idea, if you become a pastor, you have to go to people house and beg for food. Give me offering, give me offering. That's the pastor's life, they thought. So then my father said, uh, so I, because he sent me to college and he spent money, I finished my college. Then he, so we have culture, like whenever a boy get married, the father get a lot of dowry, a lot of money. The girl parents has to give a lot of gold, and it depends on the qualification. It depends on your family status, right? If your father is, see, if I get a girl for Joel, if he become a doctor and we settle in America, then we will get a lot of money from India, right? So it depends on your status, your qualification, your job. So girl parents willing to pay you a lot of money. So Jonas lost her mother when she was young. All her life, she grown up in a boarding hostel, school, boarding school, hostel. Her father took her at the age of seven years and said, okay, daughter, we'll, because he got four daughters. Then he said, hey, let me take you to uh, the restaurant. We'll eat together. Then she thought as a young girl, okay, we are going to eat. Then she, he took her to a hostel and left her there, said, I'll come within one hour, you stay here. That's it. He, she ended up there staying there for years and completed her education. Right? No mother. So what happened? No mother and father is, I should not say, he's like, you no, know, less responsible person. I'm sorry to say that. He's a less responsible towards his children. So then... My, my father was very particular to get money because he already spent. He's not a Christian. So he already looking for the, uh, like, you know, uh, girls. And so many people are, oh, your son finished college and he's a good character. You don't drink, you don't smoke. So we want to give him my girl. So we will give you, like, you know, one lakh rupees. Those days, like, one lakh means 100,000 rupees. 100,000 rupees will give you. Or 150,000 rupees will give you. So... Come, we want to give. So my father is ready. Okay, when you come back, ready, come. There are girls are standing in queue. So you can choose one who can give more, right? But I came with a proposal saying that, no, 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 I want to get married, this missionary, which is Eunice. I said, what? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want to get married, a missionary, so that I'm a missionary. If I get married, missionary, so that we both together can do a lot of big ministry. What ministry? No ministry. You are doing a job in the company, right? 
So get married and get money and well settled. He said, no, no, you don't understand that. So what I'm telling, I'm in a full-time ministry. I had to marry a full-time committed woman so that I can continue my ministry. No, 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 I don't know anything what you're talking. I need money. And I said, no, I have to get married this girl. I cannot follow you. Then he said, okay, you don't want to follow me? I'm not going to support you any money. You do your marriage by yourself. Then listen, this is the big point. So we married. We married. We were doing a ministry in a big city. And we are staying in the bachelor. I'm staying with the other colleagues, and she was staying with other colleagues in a bachelor rooms. Then when we married, we don't have money. No money, nothing. So we want to conduct a function. Like, you know, it's like, you no, know, what do you call? Reception in the city. And we got a lot of disciples, almost 250 disciples we have from colleges. We went to and shared the gospel with them. And their parents were very happy. Oh, you came and shared the gospel with my son, my daughter. So they converted and they're doing good. Thank you so much. They're all, uh, they all got a gratitude heart towards us. So if, we, if I call those days, a group of young people used to follow me. It's like I'm, I was a big guy, you know. Here, I don't have anyone. But in India, I'm a big leader. So you, all the students used to follow me. Then I want to connect a reception. When we went there, even we don't have money to stay in hotel room, in a motel room. So what we did, I sent her to our friend house, and I stayed with my friend house. We separated. Then, so we are getting ready. So we need to connect a uh, reception. We need a hall, right? I went to a pastor, because when I was doing ministry, I used to talk to him, and uh, so he knows about me. I said, Pastor, I'm planning to give you a reception for all my disciples and their parents. I need a, I need a, a hall. He said, okay, Solomon, no problem. Uh, our church got a hall. I'll so we had to pay rent. So he said, I'll book on my name. So you just pay me later whenever you have money. Oh, thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much. Then after that, we connect youth meetings. I used to use a catering one person. I call him. Hey, I'm going to give a party or a reception for the people. I need Pay me later. Oh, thank you so much. Then, you all know, I was getting up with a coat in my uh, friend room, and she was make upping herself in her uh, friend room. And we don't have a car. We got an auto, like, you know, it's auto rickshaw, like, you know, a small cycle, which is rent. So I told her, are you, how are you coming? She said, I'm going to take an auto. You know auto? Three wheels. I don't have a picture to show you. So just we pay it. It's like, you know, we pay it and uh, like, you know, go from here to other place. I said, I'm coming with the auto. Okay, when the auto comes here, I'll get into that and we'll go to reception party. Then I told her, so how much we had to pay to auto? She said, 150 rupees. So how much I have in my pocket? Just 50 rupees, right? We, we're supposed to pay 150 rupees to auto because the auto is taking us from here to the reception party. So, but I'm, I'm having coat and uh, you need dress and uh, everything, makeup and everything ready to go. I have 50 rupees. Uh, we have to pay to auto 150 rupees. We don't have money. So, but I was very, like, you know, feeling like a rich person and I have everything. And the auto person, when I went to auto, he said, okay, sir, come in and sit. I sat there and I was thinking, I was just dry. Like, you know, we were driving the auto, but my mind was going faster than that auto. Faster, faster, thinking how to pay this fellow when I get down. So how to get the money. So when I went there, we, when we stopped the auto, already our disciples, all our friends, their parents were there. So when, when I stepped out the auto, one of my friends came, hey, come on, man, welcome to reception. Everything is ready. Come on. I said, then immediately I said, Hey, pay to him 150, we'll see later. Then I just walked into inside. <laughs> then he paid. So praise God, right? So what happened next? So our reception is done. 
We had to, so many people came and they gave gifts. We don't, we don't have place to stay. Then, uh, one of my trainer, he was, he was from different, uh, different. He was my leader. He was my trainer. So he came and said, okay, I'm going to finish, sir. He came and said, he came and said, okay, Solomon, uh, you need a, you got married, so you need a house to stay, a rented house. I know one family, so you go and you talk to them, and they are willing to rent their house, one of the portion to you, so that you can stay. Then after the party, I just call them, sir, can I, so I'm the person uh, uh, willing to take your house for rent. So he said, oh, who are you? And so we'll come and talk to you, sir. Then, uh, then I asked him, can, I come and can we come and stay the tonight? We don't hear any place. He said, oh, you're most welcome. You come over here. Then night 11.30, we went again with the auto, with all the prize gifts, the reception. Then the couple, we don't know who they are. They are new, and we are new to them. They are so gracious and came and took all the prizes, and they gave us a room. Okay, tonight you stay in the room. Uh, tomorrow morning we'll talk. Then morning came. Uh, we just woke up and they made a breakfast for us. Like, you know, all Indians are very hospitable. Hospitable. If they visit their house, they'll uh, give you food, they give you water, they'll help you whatever you want. So they are most very good, good people. So Pastor Farrell knows about it. You ask him when you meet him. So they're very good hospitality. So they made the breakfast for us and we ate. Then they started asking, who are you couple? So what you are doing? What do you do actually? So what you have been doing? Is then I started sharing my testimony. I'm a first generation Christian. I, I converted. I committed life for Christ, for Christ and we are doing youth ministry. And she said her testimony. I'm also, so I lost my mother. I don't have mother. My father, and I grown up in my uncle house. And uh, before connecting marriage, my uncle died. And no one to help us, but God is helping us. Then that couple, young couple, they got a, a Canadian, Canadian, Canada uh, citizenship. They are going to move to Canada within one month. They're just getting ready. So they got a job and citizenship, everything in Canada. They're moving there. So they're renting their house to us. Then they say, after hearing our testimony, they said, OK, Salman, uh, we were really impressed with your testimony. So we thought of selling all our uh, utensils in the kitchen room, all the plates or the gas, whatever. But we are not going to sell it, but we are going to give you. Oh, thank you so much, sir. Then they said, we thought of selling our uh, 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 bed, a uh, king, king size bed, but we are not going to sell it, but we are going to give you. Oh, thank you so much, sir. We, want, we thought of selling our couch, but we are not selling, we are giving you couch. Oh, thank you so much. We thought of selling our color TV, we are not selling, we are giving you. So friends, do you remember, do you believe or not, we went back to our house and with uh, two bags of clothes, just. We go down the train in that city. When we went there, it's a rich people area, good community stayed in that house. When we opened the house, everything was there. Hallelujah. Everything was there. Nothing we bought. Everything was there. When people saw it, rich people are the great people. When they saw, my, saw our life, what these fellows, how did they go? Everything we got. God is so gracious. Hallelujah. So when you suffer, when you go through difficulties, don't think that he is somewhere and he is enjoying. No, 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 no. He is with you. God was with Daniel when he was in lion's den. God was uh, with uh, Shadrach, Meshach when they were in uh, uh, fire. God was with David when he was in the trouble when he is facing a bigger enemy, which is bigger than him. God was with Abraham when he is going through trouble. So God was with the disciples when they are facing problems. So remember, God is with you when you are going through difficulties. Amen? So finally, I want you to all stand and uh, read this psalm. Psalm 23, along with me. All together we are going to say this song 
along with me. Okay? Say it in loud. Say it, you mean it. Say in loud. The Lord is my shepherd. Altogether we'll read. The Lord is my, the Lord Jesus is my shepherd. I have, I have all that I need. Jesus let me rest in green meadows. He led me beside peaceful streams. Jesus renew my strength. He guide me along right path, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid for Jesus is close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. Jesus prepared a feast for me in the presence of my enemy. You honor me by anointing my head with oil, my cup overflows with blessing. Finally, surely Jesus' goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. We'll shout hallelujah, hallelujah. Give me a big hand. So Lord Jesus is always with me. Hallelujah, amen. Lord Jesus is always with you. Whatever the, whatever the situation you are going through, whatever, whatever the place you are walking through, but He is with you. He is with you. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank and praise the Lord for your grace and mercy in our life, Father. You are so good God. You are wonderful working God. You are awesome God. Even people may forsake us, but you will never leave us nor forsake us. Even people may betray us. People may like give up on us, but you are the Lord, one who is willing to take care of us all the time. We thank you, Lord, for the word. We thank you, Lord, for the comforting word. So where, where is my God when I'm suffering? You are, all, you are with me and you are suffering too. Where you are with me when I'm drawn to a ditch. You are with me when I'm sick. You are with me when I'm going through trouble. You are with me when I'm crying. You are with me when I'm rejoicing. You are with me all the times. You are with me when I'm in hospital. You are with me when I'm in, when I'm in a, 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 a road accident. You are with me when I'm in a trouble, financial uh, difficulties. You are with me all the time. Thank you, Lord, for being with us all the time. Thank you, Lord, for being with us all the time. We give you honor and glory to thy name. Lord, only you are the only one person whom we can trust. No one else, Lord. Only you we can trust. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Praise you, Lord. We give you honor and glory to thy name. In Jesus' mighty name. All, all the people of God say, Amen.